Hi, uh, you all right? Good. 0161 228. What? That can't be true. It is true. 0161 228 or Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk and or text 0786 206 951. Whatever you've got to say, whoever you want to say it to, is your conduit. Here's the tube you can ram it down. And then it comes out the other day, the other end. It's all disgorged in beautiful form. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry, as I was giving out the telephone number just a few moments ago, I was interrupted by the arrival of a news story. Listen to this. Pie lovers are snapping up... No, this is nothing to do with Wigan rather remarkably, nothing whatsoever to do with Wigan, pie lovers are snapping up the latest gourmet treat. Crocodile, leek and tarragon in pastry. Yeah, the exotic delicacy <laughs> has proved a hit with shoppers in Newcastle-upon-Tyne who've greedily grabbed the creations of new baker Michael Morn. Is a chemistry student, apparently, and, and indeed a PhD chemistry student. He gave up a well-paid job in the pharmaceuticals industry to set up Northern Pie. And they've been selling pies made from crocodile, ostrich, springbok and kudu. I don't either, but apparently it's an African antelope. They also do beef and nuki brown and Cheshire cheese and onion. So there, but the croc, the <laughs> the croc en croute has a coarse texture, similar to monkfish, but like everything else that isn't beef or lamb, tastes of chicken. <laughs> where, where did he get the crocodiles from? And would they know if they if they ordered from the wholesale market from I don't know, from Billingsgate or whatever? If they ordered a crocodile, would they know if instead of a crocodile, an alligator was sent? And then you'd you'd be shafted, wouldn't you? You'd be you'd be putting it in your pies, and along come would come Mr. Trading Standards. He said, "Hang on a minute, that's not crocodile, that's alligator." <laughs> Mind you, the good news is they sell it in some lovely handbags. <laughs> oh, ah, yeah, none, none, of your, none of your paper carrier bags for them. No, they're lovely, they are. Lovely. And a nice pair of shoes to boot. Dear God, what's the world coming to? There you are. Crocodile. That lady who was on earlier saying it's got really bad, she was on the market and she bought a chicken, then she made chicken sandwiches. Well, she, first of all, she had chicken, then she had chicken sandwich, then she had chicken soup. So I've never done that before. Why not? Why isn't she doing that all the time? I don't understand that. Anyway, there you go. I want to start today, for May, by reading you uh, an article, a, a titled article, out of the Guardian sports pages. Yeah, sport. But it's all related to Manchester, and it's by Steve Cram. You know that bloke who used to be able to run dead quick? You could be forgiven for thinking it's hard to get away from Manchester just now. However, at around six o'clock on Sunday evening, my exit from the city of Manchester Stadium car park was effortless, and I eased through the east end of the city. Its streets were almost empty. By contrast, hordes of red-shirted and red-backed fans enjoyed their drinks in the evening sunshine outside every pub I passed. As a football fan... I was happy for him. I, it goes on, and he says the city had played host to the Paralympic World Club over the previous five days. And while the Premier League season climax undoubtedly would take centre stage, it was a pity the Paralympians performed in front of such sparse audiences. 400 athletes from 45 countries competing, including the world leaders China. The event stature is unmatched outside of the Paralympic Games. I, I hesitate to say this because if you don't patronise people in wheelchairs and people with one eye, 
then you're an evil monster and guilty of something on a par with keeping your daughter in the basement and raping her every Tuesday. But the Paralympic Games, they're not, it's not real, is it? It's just not real. I'm sorry, that's how it is. I've got now to against people with a disability, but it's not real. Yes, it's real in the sense of a, well, a crocodile pie is real. There it is. It is tangible. You can see it. But it's not real competition. For example, no two disabilities are the same. I mean, like that lad, and good on him for trying. Let's patronise him a little bit. But like that lad who wants to run in the Olympic Games and instead of legs, he's on springs. Well... Don't be daft. That's what I say. They, they've had a committee looking at it for... We've had a committee. They've had a committee looking at it for months on end. Why? Why? It's, it's balmy. It's, it's not proper. I'm sorry, but it's not. Is it? OK, he's a lovely bloke, I'm sure. His mum loves him, if nothing else. And he's doing his best. But we don't give prizes for doing your best. We give prizes for your being faster, stronger, more able to jump high or long distances, even to hop, skip, jump. But we give prizes for being faster than people like you. Now, with disabilities, there isn't anybody like you. Yes, if you are totally blind and your opponent is totally blind, then OK, you are equal in that respect and any other, any other competition is fine. But frankly, the Paralympic Games are, well, patronising. They're just patronising. They're saying to people with disabilities, don't worry, for five days a year, will pretend you're not disabled or will pretend that you are physically now bear in mind what i'm saying here but will pretend for five days a year that you are physically as good as anybody else and you are as good but you're not as efficient and giving paralympians their own games is a nice thing to do but don't expect anybody to care because it's just not real. It's like having school sports. You know, they're all right for the mums and dads, but in the great, the great panoply of sport, they count for nothing. And it's nice that the Olympic movement from time to time pats disabled people on the head. But let's not get carried away with this is fantastic sport. 0161 228 Post-Watershed Wit and Wisdom with Sam Walker. Why is it we can get to the other side of the world in a matter of a few hours, can't get from London back home to Manchester without it taking 20 years and the train stopping every five oh, minutes? Sam Walker. Today, though, for the first time, someone went, I'm fed up in this hot weather. Oh. It's too warm. Oh, dear <laughs> me. There's always one. It's not too warm. Get a grip. Sam Walker. And I've gone a bit mad and done my own hair. And like the only scissors I could find, because I couldn't be bothered to go downstairs. You know the ones that you cut nails with that are curved at the end? And then I remembered if you cut your hair when it's wet, of course, when it dries, it bounces up. You know the hair you used to get on Lego men? It's a little bit high up. <laughs> Sam Walker. So there you go, that's for you. Tonight from 10 at BBC Radio Manchester. A very good day to you. How are you? What do you think? Come on. The, we had Steve Cram there. Went to the Commonwealth, sorry, went to the Paralympic Games, commentated on them and said how wonderful they were and how we ought to. Yeah, let's all say big stuff for the people with disabilities. Fantastic. But nobody turned up. Why? Because nobody's interested. George in Audenshaw. Hiya. Hiya. Good afternoon, Alan. Good afternoon, sir. Talking about your, your crocodile things. Oh, yes. You know, I was thinking, um, where would you buy one today? You probably get it from the crockery department at Asda. Oh, very good, the crockery department. Yes, we like that. Or, um, if you go to another shop, you can just say, uh, can I have a crocodile pie, please, and make it snappy? Ah, uh, that... That's I'm afraid... No, 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 that gag, that gag was, in the, was in the news story. Oh, was that a mystery? People are snapping them up, he said. 
So, I mean, you can't yeah. even... No, I can't e even use that no. no, it's oh. done. Sorry, no. Well, the other one's OK, though, isn't it? Well, I didn't say it was OK. No, but different. It's different. And we'll, well, go with, different. we'll go with different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, usually you get them in before I do. Yeah, well, I thought I'd leave, I'd leave the field you open. For me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of crocodile pies, I must admit. I wonder what... I know, I'm not sure. Well, they I mean, taste like chicken. That's, yeah. the, that's the rule. That's how the, the world works. If it doesn't taste of lamb, beef or, or pork, then it tastes like chicken. But apparently so there's kittens. Pardon? Apparently so there's kittens. They taste like chicken as well. Ah, uh, well, you've got the better of me. I've not eaten one. No, I haven't yet. Yeah, I've just been told I have There's a fella making a fortune. I hesitate to mention this on, mm -hmm. on account of the trouble I had last time. But there's a fella making a fortune out of squirrels. Well, yeah, but... He's you... selling squirrels. The, the, he got queues all round the block for them. Well, you should have a wholesale market in that one. I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to think I might get in touch with him. <laughs> I wonder how much he's dishing out for them, yeah. because cause I can give him plenty. No uh, trouble at all. Yeah, but the thing is, are they lead free? Uh, well, they are if you cut the heads off. Oh, OK, then. Because <laughs> 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 there's a little bit in the head. Otherwise, they're still running, but there's a little bit in the head, and after that, they're fine. But I don't think anyone eats the head anyway. Uh, but I thought they were talking about saving food. You know, you boil everything and, um, you know, like, the, even with the bones, you make everything, you mix it with it afterwards or something. Yeah, yeah that lady said that about... Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So, um, they, if she's got a lot of chicken soup, she can cure Jews of everything. <laughs> well, she can, no, because, yeah, yeah. you know, that, that is Jewish medicine, is that? Yeah, if yeah. you If you meet a poorly Jew, give him a bowl of chicken soup, the lad's as right as rain. I don't know how it works, but it's there. It must be in the Bible. I don't know. No, I've not, not heard of that one. No, well, it is. Yeah. I, I've thought of it when I've been ill, but the other operation, you have, to have, you have to have to become Jewish, has always put me off. But you can cure anything with a bowl of soup in Judea. Tell um, the world. Oh, absolutely, yeah. No idea how it works, but it does. You ask any Jewish they, mother. Do they have to call the chicken before they cook it, or just throw everything in the pot? Oh, I've no idea. <laughs> absolutely no idea how it works. If I knew that, I'd be Jewish. Oh, that's true enough. You and I don't yeah. fancy that, because yeah. that's a religion, and I, I don't really... An, it's a heck of an operation, you know. Well, it, the, the operation's rubbish, but also there's stacks of rules. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're just forever wondering about the rules. Well, I, don't, I, I don't bother with the ones here. I'm not, I'm not going to start bothering with them at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, Two kitchens, I can't be doing that. Cleaning your cupboards with a feather at Easter. That's know, balmy, I that. that. I don't know why that comes. That well, it's, it's all to do with flour. That's as far as I'm going. It's all to do with flour. Because at Passover, they have to do away with all the flour and have new flour. I don't know why. And, uh, maybe someone will tell me, but and, and a, a, a housewife, because that's how they say it, a housewife has to clean out her her cupboards yeah. with a feather to make sure she gets all the all the flour out of it. You mean like baking flour? Yeah, fla yeah, yeah. I don't mean daisies. That's I mean, I mean flour, flour, yeah. F L O U R. See, yeah. <laughs> what a nice fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it's been a pleasure. Have a good day. Okay, thank you, Alan. He came on to do the crocodile joke. I didn't think anybody would. I, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply hurt. No. <laughs> I just meant... Now, I'll, I'll mention this, because we were just having a laugh at the expense of, of, of Jewish mothers who ram chicken... It's true, I'm not making it up. Who ram chicken soup down their children when they're ill. But on a more serious note, re related more or less to the same religion, there's a story today in the Mail. Uh, a woman who risked her life saving 2,500 Jewish children from the gas chambers died yesterday, aged 98. Irina Sendler, a social worker, smuggled them out of the Warsaw ghetto and gave them false identities. Under the pretext of inspecting the ghetto's sanitation during a typhoid outbreak, she and her assistant went, into search, went in search of children who could be given a new life as Roman Catholics. They were smuggled out in ambulances and trams, sometimes wrapped as packages, and placed with families, orphanages, hospitals and convents. A team of 20 operated from 1940 to 1943, when Hitler ordered the ghetto to be raised and residents shot or sent to death camps. And uh, I don't know whether you've seen the film Schindler's List. I've seen it a couple of times now, and it is... It's an utterly, utterly stunning piece of film first of all just just as a film it is extraordinary it's based on 
Now, I've forgotten his name now, but Tom somebody or other, who's based on a, a book called Schindler's Ark, and it is, it, it's ostensibly true, and it just reminds us that inside every, every pack of evil, there is such goodness, such courage in people that it just leaves you, it leaves you stunned. It leaves you utterly, utterly stunned. If that woman had been found out, OK, she survived and she lived to the age of 91 and so also did some of the children she saved, not yet lived till 91. And you just think, what possesses somebody to put their life in danger in that way? Because you can bet your bottom dollar if she'd have been found should have been put to death, and not in a pleasant way. Not by any means in a pleasant way. And you just... Just every so often in life, you are reminded of the the abject courage of some human beings. It, it, it makes us all, as a species, collectively better. And it, it lifts every one of us, I would hope, but it also ought to diminish us. It certainly diminishes me. You look at somebody who's done something like that and you think, what have you ever done, Bessie? What have you ever done? What have you, as a human being, ever done? Most of the time, all you've really done is take and, and do things for your own benefit. You know, I'll do this because. Whereas there can have been no benefit from her, for her, other than the satisfaction of these children will live instead of dying. Extraordinary courage. BBC Radio Manchester. Headline news. Officials in China now believe nearly 12,000 people have died as a result of yesterday's powerful earthquake. A 71-year-old woman's been left badly shaken after being sexually assaulted in broad daylight in a park in Stockport. And it's been confirmed that nearly £300,000 of taxpayers' money has been spent on trying to repair East Manchester's Bee of the Bang sculpture. Manchester's weather dry with sunny spells. Highs of 20 Celsius. I'm Faye Rusko. BBC Radio Manchester. 2020 traffic. <laughs> Taking a look firstly to the M60 traffic moving uh, fairly well for the moment between Junction 18 and Sinister Island through towards Junction 22 at Failsworth clockwise and anti-clockwise, as I say, moving uh, uninterrupted. Now, if you're travelling on the M6 again, moving well between Junction 22 all the way up towards Junction 26 at the Orange Change north and southbound. Don't forget that uh, delays up to 45 minutes have been reported on Virgin train services between London, Euston, Piccadilly and Liverpool Lime Street because of some overhead wiring problems in the Tamworth area. Hopefully, though, normal service should be resumed within the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, but we will keep you updated on that situation. Don't forget, if you can update me yourself on the traffic situation where you are, why not get in touch hands-free on 01612444951. I'm Cara Banks. You're never more than 20 minutes away from the latest traffic through the day. A very good day to you, how are you? Do you want to hear something really, really, really annoying and possibly even silly? All right. It's not silly in the sense of let's all have a good laugh, although a bit of mockery perhaps wouldn't go amiss. But there's a story in The Sun. First of all, there's a photograph that's, that's appeared in The Sun and a number of other photographs. The, it's not a headline, it's what you might call a sub-headline. A bloody blade litters Britain's busiest street after a man is stabbed to death in rush hour. The same day, courts are told to let knife yobs off with a slap on the wrist. And they're talking about the murder yesterday on Oxford Street in London. This morning, the Mayor of London, and we must get used to saying this, the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, said, everybody is shocked by the level of violence we are seeing, particularly towards young people in London. The newly elected mayor is planning to introduce scanners on public transport to cut the number of weapons reaching the streets. We're meeting today with police about the immediate operational response. We're looking at the rollout of the scanner programme, making sure that the police can lift the guns and knives from people in the street, but also trying to get more police in the street to deter these criminals. Well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? More police on the street may well be the answer to the problem. But the second part of that headline... The same day, courts are told to let yobs off, knife yobs off, with a slap on the wrist. Knife yobs may escape with fines under a decree to courts issued yesterday. 
as horrified shoppers saw a man stabbed to death in Britain's busiest street. Crowds fled in terror as the rush hour victim, 22, fell dying. A bloody blade was left in Oxford Street. Soft new sentencing guidelines on knife crime and on knife knife crime on knife crime, urging fines or community service were blasted by the Tories. Well, fair enough. We're into we're into what you might call the the party politics of it all, but it does seem extraordinary, doesn't it, that the courts are being told to go easy on those that carry knives. <laughs> It, it, it's hard to understand. Carrying a knife on the face of it isn't that offensive. I, I have a knife in the car. It's been in there. It's been in consecutive cars for, good Lord, I don't know, since I ever owned a car, I think. It's a Swiss Army knife. People are going to break in my car now, aren't they, to get me Swiss Army knife. Anyway, it's been in there for donkey's years. And it's there because from time to time little things arise. You might have to, you might need the scissors or. You might meet an horse with a stone in its shoe, whatever, and you need you need your pen knife. So I've carried a knife in the car for donkey's years. But we're not talking about that. If you look at the picture of this particular knife, it's it, it's not a it's not a flick knife, I don't think. It doesn't look like a flick knife. It looks like I think we call them a lock knife. One of those where when you open it, the blade locks into place. So that if you stab someone it or cut something, it doesn't doesn't spring back and, and trap your finger, which we've all had happen to us more than once with a pen knife, haven't we? So it's 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 designed for um, should we say secure use with the blade extended. Now it ought to be it ought to be a serious offence to be caught carrying one of those, oughtn't it? And to say I'm carrying it for defence ought not to be a defence, ought not to be something that diminishes the sentence you receive should you be brought to court. Being caught carrying a knife, particularly... I mean, they, they started to bring in rules about the kinds of knife. They started to define them. And believe it or not, since they started to define knives and say you can't carry this kind of knife and you can't carry that kind of knife, kitchen knives... I kid you not, kitchen knives are flying off the shelves. People are going in and buying kitchen knives for the sole purpose of using them as a weapon. Maybe a defence weapon, I don't know, but using them as a weapon. Now, I don't know how we, how we stop that, other than perhaps to, first of all, severely punish those who are caught with a knife lock them up for a long time, perhaps. And yes, that'll mean the prisons are crowded, but who cares? They're only cons. Lock them up. So goes the theory. But we ought to stop it in the first place. We ought to make it so that it isn't worth the risk of carrying a knife. Surely. Now, I don't know how we do that. If you've any ideas, I'm sure I would love to hear them. But first of all, make it make it hard, make it so that if you want to buy a knife, if I, for example, needed to replace a kitchen knife today, then I go to the kitchen shop, I go to the kitchen equipment shop and I buy it, I've got the receipt with me, it's wrapped in the wrapper of the shop, and I take it home. And if en route I open it or lose the receipt, then I run the risk of getting in trouble. That's that's a sensible way, isn't it? That's perfectly sensible. If you're a court with a knife about your person that is not wrapped up and is not... You don't have a receipt with you for having it on your person on the way home for the shop, then you're in trouble because we will presume, not guilt as such, but we will presume that you are carrying it for purposes other than delivering it from A to B, surely. Because we can't have people getting stabbed on the street. It can't be acceptable. It just can't. We do it with guns. There can be no... There can be, in most circumstances, there is no excuse for having a gun. A handgun, it's illegal. Now, we can't make... We can't make knives illegal because, well, the chefs would go mad. That lady wouldn't be able to do her chicken soup, would she? She wouldn't be able to carve the chicken for her sandwich. So we can't make knives illegal, but we surely can make it so that you have to have an explanation for having a knife with you on the street. 
and the only explanations can be you are ready for immediate use of it. So if you're a tradesman, you carry a knife that goes with your trade. If you're, for example, I don't know, a, a, a joiner or a plumber or whatever, you need a knife. So you have a knife in your tool bag along with the saw and the chisel and all the other gubbins. If you're a, a cook going from one job to the next, then you carry your knives, but you have an explanation for those knives. But if you're just a young lad walking about, why have you got a knife? Well, I might have to use it. What for? Surely that's when we step in and say, no, your excuse, your reason for having it is not good enough. Come with me to the court, laddie. And let's not have the courts making decisions on let's go easy on them. Let's have the courts working the other way and saying, you're very, very naughty. We're going to do terrible things to you. What do you say? One six one two two eight double two double five. What do you think should happen to people who are found on the street with a knife? No matter their age, let's let's not start having a go at the young, but it does appear to be the young who are most commonly involved with knife crime. But what do you think should happen? Oh one six one two two eight double two double five. Email Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk and you can text on O double seven eight six two oh six nine five one. It's that easy. We like to make it easy. Yeah. And it, do, you remember, do you remember when the Taser... Well, not invented, but when the Taser came to the UK. And then they said, right, well, we're going to give the Taser. We're going to use it instead of a gun. So when somebody is brandishing that which looks like a gun. Like that poor beggar who was a bit doolally and had had a, probably too much to drink and was carrying a chair leg. And the police officers decided that the chair leg was a gun. And then they decided to shoot him dead. Now, we all know the outcome of that. One dead bloke and some very embarrassed police officers. But more importantly, an embarrassed police service. And yes, that would have been the ideal situation where a taser could have been used. The bloke would still be alive. He'd have two little holes in his chest and a memory of a rather painful experience. But he'd still be alive, and two police officers would not have had to go through all kinds of palaver. Frankly, and I'm dead set against capital punishment, but frankly, if a bullet comes out of a building, then the first opportunity, the police have the right and the duty to all of us to put a bullet into the building. It's cruel. It's horrible. It really is absolutely horrible. But I don't know any other way. We can't have people discharging weapons. Like the barrister, poor sod. Like the barrister firing off a, a shotgun into the street. I'm sorry, he has to be taken out. You try negotiation, you try discussion, you try everything else, but then you have to kill him. Because it isn't, it isn't, an, it isn't easy but it has to be done. And what we do is we charge our police officers with as much training as possible to get them to make the right decisions. That's fair. That's perfectly fair. We don't want them, you know, gun hoeing it all over the place, but that's what we do. We do it with our soldiers, we do it with our police officers. And then we got the taser. And the taser was a sort of halfway house. We could disable an individual without killing them. So that became a good idea. Well, we now learn from a couple of days ago that there is serious consideration being given by some police forces about the place to having all their officers, all their officers, carry and therefore have available to use the taser. They will be able to carry them. They'll have them like the truncheon, like all the other things they have dangling off their stupid vests. They, well, they are. They have everything. And they'll have that. And police in Greater Manchester have used taser guns 32 times in the last four years. Now, that's hardly at all. The use of stun guns, which emits 50,000 volt electric shock, has increased as more officers have been trained to use them. Lancashire police have used theirs 75 times since 2004. And Cheshire Constabulary, 22 times. In Greater Manchester, 
Tasers were fired on 14 of the 32 occasions they were used. In Lancashire, they were discharged 32 times. And they say that once, once the, the, the person, the suspect, sees that the red dot is upon him, he decides to well, he decides the next step's not good, so he stops. Fair enough, fair enough. But do, would you want every single copper, every single copper, to have a taser ready for use? Just imagine how often they'll get used. All the training in the world, they're going to get used. You get in a row with a copper, you raise your hand to give him a dig, which you shouldn't be doing and you're tasered. That's what's going to happen. That's tomorrow. William in Bolton. Hiya. Hello, Alan. <clears throat> you were talking about knife crime. Yeah. And um, as to whether we should have, have a situation whereby uh, youths uh, or anybody should be able to walk along the street with a knife which is intended not for tools of the trade, but in order to so-called defend themselves. Yeah. And um, the fact is there are, as you know, laws relating to offensive weapons. Um, the point is, you touched on it, are we going to get a copper coming along and saying, uh, all right, laddie, come on, off to the police station, off to the courts, um, explain yourself why have you got this knife on you. And the fact is, Alan, we'd better get real. You were talking about real Olympics. Well, I would like a real police force. We do not have police on our streets anymore. We do not have an effective uh, police force which is policing. What we have is chocolate teapots chatting to housewives on a nice sunny day who disappear, come six o'clock and the people are left to it. They are left to their own devices. To the north of Bolton there is a visitor, visitor centre at Rivington. On the walls there, there is a sign saying, if you see anybody pinching eggs, birds' eggs, dial 999. My next door neighbour, a few weeks ago, had his windows put in by some scumbags. When he dials 999, he doesn't get a copper to come to his house. I would like a real police force. It's all right talking about should we have a situation where people can walk the streets with knives, they obviously can. And I put it to you also, Alan, uh, that if the preponderance of crimes involving knives and guns or whatever was in posh areas, nice little country villages where rich people live, then something more would be done about it, I suspect. I'm, I'm always hearing that. Um, <laughs> it is... It is odd. I'm not sure that one begets the other. Yes, if there was knife crime on the streets of the posh villages, we can argue that something would be done. But we might also want to look at why it is that there aren't, in the main, knife crimes on the streets of posh villages. Mm -hmm. We might want to examine why it is. It's all very well saying if it happened there, they'd do something about it. Well, that's, that may well be a politically accurate comment. I don't know, and we'll never know. Mm. But it might be worth looking at why is it that there are areas that you and I might describe as posh areas where it doesn't happen, and then other areas like um, low-cost housing areas or um, council estates or housing association estates where it does happen. Mm. What's going on? Because they're the same human beings. If you've got, if you've got a 50 grand a year job or a ten grand a year job, you're the same human being. Why does one, the ten thousand a year job, or, or, or the ten thousand a year job living in his street, why is the why is he the one that gets stabbed? I don't I don't mm. understand that. Yeah, um, I think we're talking about the people who have most money get the security. We now have a situation in our society where the gap between the rich and the poor is getting wider. Well, I, I mean, you're right on that. I, I agree with you on the, on the sociological aspect of it, in that, yes, I, I live in a nice house, in a nice, tiny area. I know all my neighbours. Yeah. You know, and, and we don't have a village bobby. I don't think we've ever had a bobby on our street or whatever. That's how it is. 
it isn't the case that there's a copper at every lamppost in Alderley Edge no. or some of the no. fine Cheshire villages. No. It isn't that case. So why is it that in Alderley Edge and those lovely fine Cheshire villages there isn't a body of crime going on in the street? Why? Well, I don't know. There has to be a reason. I suggest that perhaps it's because people can afford to pay for security they can afford to live in gated communities. But, but, they can afford but we're talking about when you're walking down the street. We're not talking about people breaking yeah, and yeah. entering here. I suspect there's well, an awful lot of breaking and entering goes on in rich I areas. Suppose it's, um, but, but why is it that you can walk down the posh streets without getting stabbed, and yet you can't walk down what you might call the mean streets without getting stabbed? They're the same human beings. Uh, yeah, I suppose it's because there are fewer people, uh, quite frankly, that there are just fewer people in these areas and they do not live under the same pressures that ordinary people ordinary working class people have to live under all right well maybe you, you're right there maybe it's you the mentioned pressure. you mentioned uh, vigilantes a few weeks ago alan yeah. uh, uh, are we getting to the stage where society is being ruled by vigilantes and i put it to you that it has been for some time now because we can't we cannot count on a police force. All right. Good on you, William. Good on you. William says, uh, at the end of it there, he says, we're not many steps away from vigilante groups. The police force have given up. The police force, you dial 999, nothing happens. What's the next step? Well, we must protect ourselves somehow. So let's protect ourselves with vigilantes. How long can it be before groups of fathers, as we might call them, groups of fathers are getting together and travelling around in white transit vans with baseball bats? It can't be far away, can it? BBC and is that a good thing? Headline news. Officials in China now believe nearly 12,000 people have died as a result of yesterday's powerful earthquake. A group of MPs has called for urgent reforms to the system of national school tests in England known as SATs, and the annual rate of inflation has jumped to 3% from 2.5%, the biggest rise in more than six years. Manchester's weather dry with sunny spells, highs of 20 Celsius. I'm Faye Roscoe. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. Well, thankfully, uh, Virgin Train Services has now resumed normal service between London Euston, Piccadilly and Liverpool Lime Street. Now, we had some earlier problems in the Tamworth area with uh, the wiring, but thankfully that seems to have been rectified now. And again, trains are running to schedule. Taking a quick look to the roads around the Manchester area, if you're heading for the M56, the Sharston Link eastbound, watch out, narrow lanes continue heading towards the M60 with a speed restriction in force of 40 miles per hour whilst bridge maintenance work continues between Junction 3 Bagley and 2 at Sharston. And in East Didsbury, Kingsway on the A34 is down to one lane either side of the road between Junction 3 of the M60 and Wormslow Road. Don't forget, of course, if you can update me, do get in touch hands-free 0161 244 I'm Cara Banks. BBC Radio Manchester Sports. Good afternoon. Sale fullback Ben Foden has missed out on his first England call-up for this summer's tour of New Zealand. It was widely expected he'd make Martin Johnson's 32-man squad. Foden, meanwhile, must make do with a place in the Saxon squad for next month's trip to the USA and Canada. His Sale teammates Charlie Hodgson, Andrew Sheridan and Richard Wigglesworth have, however, been included in the senior squad. Head coach Johnson has named Steve Borthwick as his captain in place of the injured Phil Vickery. Steve was a obvious choice. I think he's very well respected amongst the squad. He's, a, he's a, an established international player. He's a very good leader. He's a, a model player in the way he approaches the game. So, you know, he was a, he was a natural choice to, to lead the squad. Cristiano Ronaldo has reiterated his desire to stay at Manchester United. Despite interest from Real Madrid, who've gone public with their desire to sign the Portuguese winger, Ronaldo says he's at the right club. Didier Drogba is adamant he and Chelsea teammate John Terry will be fit for next week's Champions League final against United in Moscow. Both players sustained injuries in Saturday's one-all draw with Bolton. Sunday's draw, rather. Ronaldo believes that United, though, will have the momentum going into the final following their Premier League triumph. This title gives co confidence and motivation to do a great game in the final and help you win. You know it's a, it's a tough game, Chelsea is a great team, but you need to think about yourselves. If you play with confidence, with, um, with your show in, um, in, in the games, in the Premier League, I think we have a great chance. 
Stockport County are advising fans that they won't be able to buy tickets for Saturday's crucial playoff semi-final second leg against Wickham on the day of the game. Although the match is not yet a sellout, the club are urging fans to buy tickets well in advance. Manchester City fly out for their end-of-season trip to Thailand and Hong Kong this evening. City owner Taksin Shinawatra has promised that his review of the season during the tour will finally resolve the future of Sven Jorn Eriksson. Eriksson says decisions need to be made quickly. Some of the players finish contract and they they haven't been clearly said if they can have a new contract or leave. Uh, someone wants to have a new contract and neg all negotiations blocked since five, six weeks ago. So of course it's uncertainty uh, around all the place. And City will find out later this afternoon whether they'll play in next season's UEFA Cup via the Fair Play League. We'll keep you updated, of course, here on BBC Radio Manchester. Berry Football Club will play Sheffield United in a pre-season friendly at Gig Lane. The former Shakers boss Kevin Blackwell will lead the Blades to Berry on the 29th of July. Hull could be kicked out of the Challenge Cup after the Rugby Football League revealed they're investigating a claim that the Super League Club fielded an ineligible player in their fifth round win over Widnes. Prop forward Jamie Thackray rejoined Hull from Leeds more than three weeks after the initial cup deadline, but still played in their win over the Vikings on Sunday. An away trip to Leeds is the reward for Wigan in the last eight of the competition, and after last night's 106 points to eight thrashing of Whitehaven, it's a tie that head coach Brian Noble is eagerly anticipating. I think any rugby player should enjoy playing there. It's a fantastic stadium and... You know, I enjoy coaching there. They'll recognise that they think it's tough as well, so they'll be very, very ready. So it makes for a, a fantastic quarter-final, doesn't it? Finally, following the defeat to Oldham in the fifth round of the Challenge Cup, Dewsbury have parted company with their head coach, Andy Kelly, and his assistant, Ryan Sheridan. Your Sunday morning lion with Mike Shaft. Why is there this feeling then towards <laughs> Israel by the Palestinians? Well, I mean, if I knew that, I'd be Prime Minister. <laughs> Mike Shaft. Tell us about Sanctus One. Is it just a normal church if such a thing exists? Sanctus One was established about six years ago now. It's a fresh expression of an emerging church. We try and reflect the culture of the city centre. We're very affirming. Our reflections are very much culturally engaged in what people are doing. Manchester's faith, spirit and life's difficult questions with Mike Shaft. I think you get the idea, don't you? Sunday morning from 7 on BBC Radio Manchester. A very good day to you. Uh, Teddy Moston, talking about the Paralympics, says, a Spanish basketball team once pretended to be mentally ill so that they could compete in the Paralympics. They won gold. When I think about the... <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I found it funny when it happened, but there you are. When I think about the Paralympics, I can't get the South African cricket team out of my head. In the 1970s, they picked a one-legged Norwegian for the team. White people still dominate African sport. The South African rugby team currently have more whites than the English one. That's Ted in Moston. Thank you very much for that. I remember that Spanish basketball team. It was fun, wasn't it? 0161 228 Carol in Blakely. Hiya, Carol. Hello, Valen. What can we do for you? Um, I'm a mother of 11-year-old, and at the moment it's sort of like, you know, the biggest week of their life starts oh, so yeah. far. yeah. And, you know, because I'm in education and I understand it all, I've been spending an awful lot of time over the last couple of months calming my son down and telling him, you know, just do your best and everything like that. And for the last two days, as we've had the telly on in the morning, this is raging argument about are they any good? And I'm thinking, you know, is this appropriate when they're about to sit down to it? <laughs> You know. Quiet, yes. You're, you're saying to him, don't worry, don't worry, just do your best, and all the, the world is, is peddling like mad around him. Yeah, and it's sort of like, you know, they're all going on. Are they valid and all of this? I mean, we've, I remember this debate when he was coming up to his stats, uh, Key Stage 1. Mm. And, you know, it was all, you know, he was too young to understand it then. But it was sort of like, you know, they're not appropriate, let's get rid of them. And all these years later, they're still around. You know, so let's have the debate afterwards. Not before. Let the kids, you know, <laughs> chill out and, you know, do the best how that they can. How important are they? Well, uh, in my point of view, no exam's really important. It just gets your foot in the door. But, but you, I mean, I don't know your age, but when I was coming up to 11 and just after 11, we had the 11 plus in those days, and that really was important because that decided 
for want of a better term, the quality of your education from them on. If you, if you passed, you went to grammar. If you very nearly passed, you went to you went to a technical school. And if you failed because you were thick, you went to a secondary modern. That was it. Yeah, but that, you see, you just made the classic mistake, Alan. If you're thick, lots of people don't handle actually exams very well. Mm. They can be brilliant in the classroom. They can be brilliant in the theatre. But sitting down, pressure, woof, it goes. But don't we don't we want to find out? Not just have you got? They used to say, have you got the book learning? We want to find out if you can work under pressure, don't we? Even at that age, because because grammar school education is, is a lot more. I mean, it's gone now, except in Trafford. But but grammar school education is a, there's a lot more pressure on you than, than if you go went to the secondary modern. It's just the actual exam itself that people... Mm. I mean, I spend a lifetime... I mean, if I had a pound for every person I meet in my job, that of people who've, you know, bluffed, you know, fluffed exams and everything like that, but are really very good at doing the job, mm. it's the actual exam itself, not the pressure. Yeah. It's the fear of the unknown. Given the exam a second time round, they're fine. It's the fear of the unknown. I mean, for kids at Key Stage 2, when they get into high school... I don't know what that means. You it's be... 11 years old. Okay, it's what right, they Key do Stage just 2, OK. Just as they're leaving primary school. Yeah. When they get to high school in September, sometime round about October, they sit what's called, and I hate these American terms, the CATs, you know, the CATs, yeah. which are very similar, which actually puts them in their groups of, you know, abilities once they've had time to settle into high school. So these are just pigeonholing kids, and the only people who benefit from them are the schools themselves. You know, good glee tables, that sort of thing. The poor kids themselves, you know, they just sort of, like, have got all this pressure, and then suddenly even on the news, are they appropriate? And they're thinking, well, why am I sitting it then? <laughs> well, <laughs> the discussion yesterday was exactly the discussion you've just touched upon, and what they're saying is that because we now have these measures these methods of measuring the success or otherwise of a school and then there is a consequence of that measure the teachers the head teachers and the teachers themselves are all working toward getting the children to pass the test rather than to be educated more, more exactly. roundly so they end up passing the test they get good results and they rise to the top of the table and there's a queue of people wanting to go to the school. They get bad results. The next thing you know, the school's shutting because nobody wants to go to it. That's exactly the point. I mean, you know, for in year six, year six in the primary school is all about teaching kids how to pass an exam. You know, they do, they do do some extra, you know, education time things, but it's preparing them and getting them ready to actually pass an exam. So, you know, is the assessment that we're doing, you know, what are we assessing them on the fact that they can pass an exam or what they've actually learned? Mm. You know, so there's all that. I mean, we've got the same thing in the 14 to 19 group on this new national diploma. You know, but the headache of that is going to be how do we manage it all between school, college and the workplace? How are we going to correlate it all and actually get these files ready, you know, to show learning has taken place? We're very big on, you know, active learning as, le you know, Ofsted comes in. Is learning taking place and all of this? How do you know when you're only passing and to actually pass an exam? <laughs> well, that, that is the problem. In fact, every time we get the GCSE results and all the other exams, I've forgotten the name of them all now, there seem to be so many and they are, they're always changing. But every time we have this debate about whether the children are cleverer than their equivalent 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And the government's argument is, well, yes, they are, because look how many pass. And then everybody else says, well, that's all right, they pass, they know how to pass the exam, but they can't read, they can't write, they can't count. I mean, a classic example a few years ago, I was with some people who were all university educated and they're, they're, they're spooning out something into jars and it's all going everywhere. And me, I've never been to university, you know, can't go to the photocopy machine, get a piece of paper out, put it as a funnel, stick it in the jar and tip everything in it. No mess. <laughs> <laughs> put, <that in, laughs> put that in your degree and smoke it. Good on you, Carol. Cheers, love. And okay. you know what you've just done, don't you? What? You've just had a debate about the sats. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time as telling us we should shut up about them until I they're know, over. I know, but all the kids are actually Oh, that's, that's your excuse, is it? Good on you. Cheers, Bye. Carol. Have a good day. Chris in Wigan. I, uh, <laughs>
good, mo- good afternoon, Mr. Bezzi. Good afternoon, I've sir. I've just listened to that lady you've just had on uh, give a view- point of view about SATs from a parent's point of view, and that's yeah. fair enough. Now, let me give an ex-teacher's point of view. Please do. When the SATs initially came in and when the way they were envisaged was that they were going to be a snapshot, they were going to be a true and accurate reflection of a child's standard up to that point. Where it's all fallen down is the fact that devious and unscrupulous head teachers have decided to change the curriculum towards teaching for the exam, which, of course, is what happened with the 11 plus. So, therefore, all the other benefits of the curriculum went out of the window. All it did was create a a massive amount of work for the teachers, increase pressure for the children, and reduce the children's broad, balanced curriculum, which is what the national uh, curriculum set out to do in the first place. So, literally, they were sort of hoist by their own petard. Now, there's nothing whatsoever wrong with putting children under pressure at that age, or at any age. Um, The the lady, for example, spoke about um, having the SATs, and you rightly uh, cited the case of the 11 plus. Mm. She then went on about putting people into groups and going into pigeonholes. Well, I remember that happening when I joined Blessed John Rigby Grammar School. We were put into groups, which at that time reflected our ability. Uh, But once we were in the grammar school, once again, as you so rightly said, it was pressure, pressure, pressure from the first year to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth. It was a constant exam factory uh, whose whole purpose was to get you through all levels at the end of it. But it didn't kill any of us. Okay, it didn't kill you. Um, One or two, one or two struggled because, uh, unfortunately, whilst they could pass the 11 plus, they didn't quite have the ability to keep up with the work. Or maybe for other reasons, they just lost interest. Something called adolescence probably came along. Um, You used a phrase a little bit back. It fell apart, that's my phrase, because of, and I quote, devious and crooked heads. Well, I know you're not talking about people fiddling the books and stealing the money and the like, but in what way are they devious and crooked if if their employers, the government, ultimately, their employers says, here is the yardstick by which you will be measured, how is it devious and crooked? It, it may be misguided on the government's part, but how is it devious and crooked? on the head teacher's part to say this is the yardstick we're going to concentrate because on. Because the head teachers uh, themselves should have had the strength and the moral courage to turn around to the government and say, no, this was set up as a system to find out what children can do. Not, this is a system that's designed to be uh, isn't, isn't that to, a... to be worked at so that, so that we can then say what children can do, which is a completely different kettle of fish. Uh, as a former teacher, isn't that somewhat naive, given that the government isn't... And, well, this is and probably why I am de- a former teacher, Alan, <laughs> because I went into the job with high aspirations yes, and so yes. on. Yeah. Uh, but I found that I met people who, who really wouldn't have been out of place on The Apprentice. Vicious, nasty people who, who just... Uh, well, really, they, they'd have been far better off in industry because um, the backstabbing that went on and, and the underhand behaviour that, that, that they put onto people, in, especially in terms of bullying and so on, uh, as I say, would have been far better in industry. And yeah, I used to, I used to always think about that phrase from um, a man for all seasons, where um, <coughs> the, the the chancellor, Sir Thomas More, uh, says to his accuser, Sir Richard Rich, "What doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? But for Wales, rich." And that's the way it was with their teachers. For forty thousand pounds a year, they sold their soul. <laughs> I, I, I mean. Hasn't teaching always been a matter of getting them through the exam? We, we referred to the 11 plus, and I remember the drive at our school. Now, I missed a lot of it because I broke my leg just before well, the Alan, exam. Well, Alan, if it's a matter of getting people... I will interrupt you. I'm sorry, but I have to do If it's a matter of getting people through the exam, then fine. Then don't bring out, in 1988, 10 or 12 or 14 different folders, call it the national curriculum, trying to get a quart into a pint pot. Don't go telling teachers we want a broad, balanced curriculum. Chris, if, gonna, if it's gonna, just going to be a case of getting through the exam, then just teach the exam, but at least be goddamn honest about it. <laughs> there it is. Eh? Chris, with a call for honesty in education. Wouldn't that be nice anyway? Summer's here. Fancy a festival for music, art and poetry? Join me, Becky Want, this afternoon from 2. BBC Radio Manchester. 
The gist of it is that Chris says the education system said we want the SATs, but we also want this broad-based curriculum. What we got was the SATs. Now let's all jump past this line. 0161 228 225. 5.1 FM, DAB Digital Radio and the World Wide Web. This is Manchester. BBC Radio Manchester. One o'clock, Chinese soldiers search for survivors of the earthquake and police hunt a man who sexually assaulted a pensioner. Sales Foden misses out on an England place. Well, this afternoon is going to be dry with some sunny spells and it'll stay warm as well with top temperatures of 20 Celsius. And just a quick reminder, Virgin train services have now been resumed to their normal schedule between London, Euston and Manchester, Piccadilly. Good afternoon, I'm Faye Roscoe. Chinese soldiers and relief workers are searching through destroyed buildings near the epicentre of yesterday's earthquake to find the thousands of people believed to be trapped. Officials say more than 12,000 people are known to have died in and around Sichuan province and aid agencies have warned that figures could rise dramatically. Francis Marcus from the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies in Beijing praised the rapid response of rescue workers. Rescue efforts have been proceeding with a great pace and determination and, and efficiency. What exactly is going to be needed and how they're going to deploy the, the resources necessary, I think is, is still a work in, in progress because the full extent of the picture is, is yet to, to be clear. A 71-year-old woman's been left badly shaken after being sexually assaulted in broad daylight in a park in Stockport. The woman was walking her dog at half past four on Friday when she was attacked from behind. Her collarbone was broken by the man during the incident. Detective Inspector Terry Sweeney is urging anyone who saw anything to get in touch. We were relying on people uh, to cast their minds back to Friday afternoon. As you said, the weather was, uh, was glorious that day. We know there were a lot of people in the park um, and we're just hoping that uh, on hearing this announcement they could come forward and help us with trying to find this man. But I, I do have to reassure the public that attacks of this sort are, are very, very rare and particularly in daylight and we wouldn't want this to stop people enjoying themselves in Brentwood Park. A course heard a bus driver who hit and killed a lollipop lady in Salford may have lost control of his bus after suffering a coughing fit. Stephanie Davis was killed as she stood on the pavement. Stephen Wilson denies causing death by dangerous driving. Naomi Cornwell reports from Manchester Crown Court. Stephanie Davies had been on patrol outside Seedley County Primary School one afternoon in September 2006 when a bus veered across the road and mounted the pavement. She died at the scene. Today, Manchester Crown Court heard that passengers on the bus had noticed the driver, Stephen Wilson, suffer a coughing fit just before the crash. The prosecution alleges this caused him to lose control of the vehicle and claims he should have stopped the bus to finish coughing instead of trying to continue. Mrs Davies' husband, Martin, had been on his way to collect their daughter from the school. In a statement, he told the court he heard an almighty noise, ran, and on seeing her lollipop lady's cap on the ground, realised it was his wife. The case continues. A man's been arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to commit the murders of two men in Manchester. Tyrone Gilbert was shot in July last year while at the wake of Yukal Chin, who was killed the previous month. The 32-year-old man's in police custody for questioning. Several people have already been charged with various offences in connection with the ongoing investigation into both murders. Official figures show there's been a significant rise in the rate of inflation. The Consumer Prices Index, which is linked to many salary and pensions scheme stood at 3% in April, up from 2.5%. Analysts say rising utility bills and food prices are behind the increase. And fire crews are at the scene of a large blaze on the Bolton Berry border. They're tackling a large amount of plastic that's caught fire at the Bradley Fold Industrial Estate. BBC Radio Manchester. Sports with Delic Lloyd. There's no place for Ben Foden, but sale teammates Charlie Hodgson, Andrew Sheridan and Richard Wigglesworth have all been in included in the England squad for this summer's tour of New Zealand. Foden has instead been named in the Saxon squad for the trip to the USA and Canada. 
Cristiano Ronaldo has reiterated his desire to stay at Manchester United, despite interest from Real Madrid, who've gone public with their wish to sign the Portuguese winger. Ronaldo says he's at the right club. Didier Drogba is adamant he and Chelsea teammate John Terry will be fit for next week's Champions League final against Manchester United in Moscow. Both players sustained injuries in Sunday's draw against Bolton. Drogba hurting his knee and Terry dislocating his elbow. Berry Football Club will play Sheffield United in a pre-season friendly on the 29th of July at Gig Lane. And the Rugby Football League is investigating a claim that Hull fielded an ineligible player in their Challenge Cup fifth round win over Widnes. Hull re-signed prop forward Jamie Thackeray from Leeds on March the 27th, more than three weeks after the initial cup deadline. And he played in their win over the Vikings on Sunday. BBC Radio Manchester, satellite weather with Heather Stott. Well, it's dry again this afternoon with some good spells of sunshine. It's going to feel a little bit cooler than yesterday, but it should still feel quite warm. We've just got a light or moderate easterly wind and top temperatures of 20 Celsius. Alan Bezik, halfway through your workday. BBC Radio Manchester. 0161 228 if you want to talk to Manchester. Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk if you want to do it via email and you can text on 07786 206951. And Simon, on the subject of tasers, says your suggestion that tasers may be used to coerce the public into obeying the police is already happening in the United States today. And it's got to the point that doctors are now being threatened with legal action by Taser International because they're declaring that causes of death are... Ta so they're saying the cause of death is from the Taser. Police in America are now using Tasers to coerce people into cooperation. And here's the article. Uh, don't blame the Taser. Uh, there's been a number of reported deaths of people soon after those individuals were subdued by law enforcement using a taser stun gun. More and more medical examiners have included the taser shocks as part of the cause of death. However, the taser company is not at all pleased. So there you are. Um, you can't blame them for not being pleased. But it, it is a risk, isn't it? If you fire 50,000 volts into somebody, there's a... There's a reasonable chance, A, they're not going to like it, and they're going to feel a bit awkward about it. The late chief constable had it done to him just to show how safe it was, but he was fit as a butcher's dog. I feel sure that some of members of the criminal fraternity, or even those who are thought thus to be, are not as fit as they might be, and it could finish him off. It could. Alan, what annoys me, this is from David, about the fact that Britain's most senior judge, Lord Chief Justice Phillips, has advised that those discovered with knives for the first time should escape with a community order. The man in the street is now convinced this is the fault of the government. And Dave, and I think by that you mean the leader of the opposition, David Cameron, and Dave will be rubbing his hands together. I wonder about the political neutrality of the judge. Um... I'm just trying to think who appointed the current Lord Chief Justice. I think he was appointed by the, not the current incumbent, he's not been around long enough and would never come to a decision anyway, but, but by all accounts. But he's been, I think he was appointed by the current establishment, the current Labour Party in government. I think he was, but I could be wrong. I'm happy to be corrected. And Ted's back. A, not a not a new new uh, bleh, not a newly expressed view for you, Ted. This one, but no matter, Ted in Moston. Why do we always concentrate on the Holocaust when Stalin was murdering many millions more, both before and after? Stalin did his fair bit for genocide. He relocated thousands of Kazakhs to Siberia, where they were worked to death. More Jews were killed in the Soviet Union, many merely for possessing religious belief, as were Christians, Muslims, and indeed other faiths. The Soviet Union was founded on blood. At least the Germans voted for Hitler. The Russians merely supported the Bolsheviks because they wanted Tsar Nicholas II out. They didn't support their policies, and when it was clear that no one supported them once they were in power, they started the Red Terror. About 70,000 people were killed, and by 1922, when Lenin died, 20,000 were in concentration camps. How anyone can believe that this religious cult which is what the Soviet Union was, basically, was somehow better than Hitler's Germany, I'll never know. In retrospect, the Second World War was a victory for evil. 
the USA walked away a superpower after fleecing its supposed ally. The Soviet Union continued its evil until 1953 and the British Empire collapsed. That's an interesting argument. The bit I, I've heard the bit before from you, Ted, about the Stalin's murderous endeavour, and he, he, he was indeed an evil leader, and Lenin before him was not much better by all accounts. But the idea that the Second World War was a victory for evil, how would that sit on Armistice Day? How would that sit amongst those men and women who fought that war and believe and believe that they won it interesting the second world war was a victory for evil because the soviet union continued to do what it wanted to do and uh, rather more so the americans became a superpower they weren't a superpower going into that war but they became a superpower as a result of various things, including their access to nuclear technology, which they've used since. And when I say used, I don't mean they've bombed people with it, but the, you don't have to... The best weapons in the world never get fired, do they? The best weapons in the world never get fired. Why? Because you don't need to fire them, because you've got them, which is why we have the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, stopping other people getting those weapons and thus diminishing the value of the, 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 the value of the weapon to those who have already got them. Exactly. So, yes, it is interesting. The Second World War was a victory for evil, says Ted. What do you say? 0161 228 And dear Alan says, Bert in Macclesfield, never mind whether such delicacies are crocodile or alligator. This is the story about alligator pies being sold in Newcastle upon Tyne. Never mind whether such delicacies are crocodile or alligator. Whose bloody pastry is it? With Becky Wants, it's Friday afternoon, every afternoon. Every afternoon. It's far too much pampering for men. Really? Oh, female go to stock in hairdressers yeah. yeah. for three four yes. hours for men 20 minutes it's not too much <laughs> your point is it's all right for women i'm not sure about men more manchester more becky it's all drilling and there's blokes out there with those yellow hats on like they wear those hot well, i think they call them hard hats today they do it's, it's, it's like a single out of a ymca then for you, isn't it? <laughs> probably quite yes. enjoying it you can do all the actions becky wants i actually rather do like it i have to say this afternoon from two at bbc radio manchester a very good day to you. <laughs> it's, it's all right. <laughs> I just read an email from Kevin who said, Are you doing this for a joke? You are, aren't you? You're doing it for a joke. Today, you're inviting comments on how to deal with violent crime when only yesterday we decided that the police don't have the power to force somebody to turn the volume down on their radio or record player. <laughs> <laughs> we learned yesterday that it's not a police matter anymore. No. If, of course, you stuff a 12 ball through the letterbox as your neighbour and blow him away because he's been playing music loud for 25 hours, I think the cops sort of take an interest then. Not for a day or two, obviously, but, but, they, but they take an interest then. I'm, I'm back on me, me hobby horse. I think the police's job is to look after all of us. It isn't. It isn't simply to solve or pretend to solve the big crimes. And uh, people say there aren't enough police officers on the beat. And when you say that, when they say that, the police then say, we've got more police officers now than we had last Tuesday, the Tuesday before, and ten years before. Yes, they have. But they're all doing something else. They're not, the coppers are all doing something else. You join the police, you spend two years walking... I don't know whether it's still two years. You spend two years walking the beat... And then you get recruited to a squad. Absolutely. You end up on the drug squad or the vice squad. Or now, now, the police are all doing terrorism now, isn't it? It's all, oh, yeah, it's all terrorism now. We've got to stop terrorism. Oh, yes, everybody's been, everybody's working towards the ending of terrorism. Whilst the streets that you and I walk can go to hell in a handcart because nobody wants a police nose. Good God, no. They want to be a traffic cop or a dog handler or ride a bloody horse about all day so they can turn up once every third year for a football match. That's what they're doing now. They're, on, they're all on squads. There's nobody left. We've got so many bloody 
chiefs now. We're out of Indians, and it's Indians we need. We want people, apparently, we want people walking the beat. We want people saying, Oi, you, come here, I want a word with you. There's none of that anymore. It's not, Oi, you, come here, I want a word with you. He won't notice you until you become a murderer, and then the murder squad can move in. Or if you happen to be carrying a bomb on your back and the terrorism squad. Or, worst crime of all, here's one... Here's one. The worst crime of all, you're driving a motor car. Alan Bassett. BBC Radio Manchester. If we did away with all the squads so that coppers were just, well, coppers. <laughs> what a novel idea. The copper was just a copper. We we put him on a train. Anna, Anna, they're in there as well. Not the same. No, nothing like the same. But you put him on you put him on a training course. You teach him all the different skills. When you say, as I do from time to time, we should hive off and, and I still think this, we should hive off the whole of the traffic policing. Just send that off and have it like traffic wardens and those other noddy act clowns. Let them do that. Just hive it. You don't need the police to do that. You don't. Anyone can point a bloody radar gun. How hard is it? There's a story in the papers yesterday of a police officer in Scotland and he pointed his radar gun and the vehicle went past at 300 miles an hour. Thought, Good God, what's that? It was a low-flying plane. I mean, how hard is it for crying out loud? Exactly. Anyone can point a bloody radar gun or sit in a van uh, with a camera. God bless and save it. I could do that without any training at all. I could. I'd have to have someone to look after me, but I could do it. It's not hard. So hive off the traffic cops, give that over to a load of half-wits instead of the highly skilled, highly trained individuals we've got now. It, exactly. A guy goes on a course, spends a lot of time on a course, he learns how to march, he learns how to make an arrest, he learns how handcuffs works, he learns about evidence, and then spends the next five years driving about on a motorbike, following people around on that other lot. Every day, they spend the first hour of their day cleaning arse crap out the stable. There are highly trained police officers. They cost a bloody thousand training, these guys. They actually spend the first hour of their day cleaning arse crap out the stable, brushing the arse. What? What? What's that all about? We don't need that. They can get Diane Oxbury to do that. She's got bugger all to do all day. Let her do it. She can clean arse muck out with the best of them. And she'd never make a copy. She's not tall enough. The whole thing is barmy. They're all doing stuff that's got nothing to do, nothing to do with policing. They're all doing specific policing. In other words, we've got thousands and thousands in Greater Manchester. We've got thousands and thousands of specialists. Unfortunately, no GPs. That's the problem. It's, a, it's like if you it's like in America really if you if you the comparison it's a, it's a poor one I'll grant you but the comparison is with the medical health service hmm there is the comparison and it works well as a comparison because in America you don't have GPS if you've got something wrong with your ticker you go to the art specialist if you've got something wrong with your plumbing, you go to the gynaecologist. If you've got, and all that, so you work out what's wrong with you, and then you go off. Whereas here, you can go to a GP, you can go to a doctor who faffs about in all the undergrowth of humanity and does all sorts of stuff. And you do that, and that's fine. That's fine, that works. Where you're getting fewer and fewer GPs, they're all getting corralled now into these dirty, great big stuff. But they get corralled. And, but you don't have that in America, you have specialists. And then you have the hospital, which is like the emergency. You know, you go there and they look after you, providing you're rich enough. A bit like the cops. Dial 999. Dial 999 from a council estate in Wigan, and somebody comes round within the month, whether you need it or not, they're there. Yeah. You dial 999 from an elderly edge and say, our house is being burgled. <coughs> hey, that's how it goes. That's how the world is. And that's the comparison. There's all these specialists who are really, really good at what they do. But there's nobody left doing the general day-to-day -day work. And that's what people want. People want to see coppers on the street. I want to see coppers on the street. I'm more concerned, more concerned about little bits of crime than I am about the dirty, great, huge crimes. I am. 
I'm not worried. I'm not very worried about I'll get murdered in my bed tonight. I'm not that worried about if I walk through Manchester, a bus will blow up and kill me. The chances of that happening are very, very slim indeed. Very slim indeed. Literally, millions and millions and millions to one. But the chances of a little old lady walking through the park with her dog and getting molested, as we've heard about today, they're high. The chances of somebody walking about and getting sworn at by some scally are high. They were low when I was a kid. What's the difference? Well, when I was a kid, you didn't go far without you bumped into a copper. He didn't have a car, he didn't have a radio. He probably wouldn't have bothered with fingerprinting and all the rest of it. But he's protected you. He protected us. Have we got it wrong? BBC Radio Manchester. Headline news. A court's heard a bus driver who hit and killed a lollipop lady in Salford may have lost control of his bus after suffering a coughing fit. Official figures show there's been a significant rise in the rate of inflation. Analysts say rising utility bills and food prices are behind the increase. And fire crews are at the scene of a large blaze on the Bolton Berry border. They're tackling a large amount of plastic that's caught fire at the Bradley Fold Industrial Estate. Manchester as weather dry with sunny spells and staying warm highs of 20 celsius i'm faye rusco bbc radio manchester 2020 traffic as you just heard there in the news, a number of problems in the Berry area. Traffic really struggling because of the closure of Radcliffe Moor Road. That's the A665 that shut off both ways because of that building fire on Berry New Road on the A58. As I say, localised delays are forming fairly quickly. Please for the moment redirecting traffic in the area. Thanks to Chris and Anne for your updates. Now, don't forget, of course, that it's the UEFA Cup final tomorrow. A number of closures in force around the Manchester area. Albert Square and Princess Street, amongst uh, some of them to uh, mention. Mount Street as well will be closed from 6am alongside John Dalton Street and River Park Road. Now we will keep you updated throughout the next uh, couple of days uh, as to those restrictions and how they're progressing. Don't forget of course if you can update me then do get in touch, make sure it's hands free as always and the number you need to dial is 0161 244 4951. I'm Cara Banks. Helping Manchester, help Manchester. BBC Radio Manchester Interaction with Linda Kay. If you think you're pretty good behind the wheel, this could be your perfect hobby. The Institute of Advanced Motorists put thousands of people through their advanced driving tests. And if you love driving, you could be one of their coaches. You do this by passing an advanced driving test, then you can become an observer, which basically means that you're going to lift your driving skills to a higher level, but learn how to coach others. Perry Freeman. It's quite easy. There is a national observer training programme. It's done by sitting alongside a driver in a car and observing their driving, point out their errors, correct the errors and lift their driving standards. It's £85 to take the test and all the money goes back to the charity to help improve road safety. But that's not the only reason to do it. I do it for the kick. The ability to actually take somebody out who hasn't got that experience and then show them a different way of driving that's more exciting, they'll get much, much more out of their drive than they've ever thought possible. If you want to know more about advanced driving or being an observer, call Interaction for a free information pack. 0161 244 4321. If you're really passionate about your driving, it's a lot of fun. BBC Radio Manchester Interaction with CSB Broadcast. 0161 244 4321. BBC Radio Manchester. 0161 Ian in Timperley. Hi, Ian. Hi, Alan. How are you all right, mate? Not bad. What can we do for you? Good, Al. Just a quick one about the lady that's been molested in the park. Yes. I uh, feel quite strongly about this one because I actually know the relatives of the lady. OK, well, don't give me uh, any more personal details. No, no, well, personal I won't, details. won't give any information. That's no. all right, thank you. Um, it's just, I find it, uh, everything you've just been saying then about the police work and what they do, I've been thinking about it for a long time now, how, like, round my area, you, you see the kids in the same places causing the same mither. Why can't they just have a, a unit that goes out to these places and that's what they do all night? But, you know, go at different times so the people don't know when they're coming. 
and try and sort things out that way. You never, ever see a copper anywhere. No, the I only mean... time you see him is at a football match or pulling someone up on the road. Mm. You don't see him at all, there, do there you? Was a, there was a lovely story, a police force, and I've forgotten where it is, to my shame, but a police force in the UK is... Uh, they've implemented a policy whereby they, for want of a better term, harass youngsters. So if, the, if there's been a lot of complaints of y about youngsters in a particular area, they put a squad of police officers on them, they filmed them, filmed them almost constantly, and everywhere they go, the cops go, they follow them everywhere. Yeah. Harass I mean, them to mither it. I mean, yeah. uh, that's fine if there have been complaints about them and if there have been some investigation and found that perhaps those complaints are justifiable. It's harassment otherwise and not acceptable, yeah. but it, but on the face of it, a remarkably sensible policy. Yeah. Well, I don't mean, you know, the kids are, are going to hang about without causing trouble. I, don't, I mean, the trouble spots, you know, where mm. you're getting complaints from. I mean, I could... If, if you and me and a few others got together, you'd know where to go to look, and you'd know where the trouble causes are. Well, that, well, that that's the problem, isn't it? Because if, if the police don't do it, there's it's not going to be too long before what we've done at the moment. Society has decided that they don't like the look of the streets, so we've all moved behind our front doors, haven't we? Yeah, We've all yeah. stopped living on the street. We now live behind our front doors. Yeah. And the next stage is that somebody says, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm fed up of being a prisoner in my own home, as it were. I'm going to take back the streets. And yeah. that's when you start to get really serious problems, because that's when you're going to get, as I said earlier, half a dozen dads in the, the back... In the, yeah, exactly, in the back <laughs> of a transit with baseball bats, yeah. saying if the cops won't make the streets safe, we will. Yeah. And but then you're in a real dangerous now, situation. Before that does happen. Well, it, now it's would be a good happen. time. Now yeah. would be a good time. But yeah. what is the answer? How do you do it? How would you well, have it done? Well, I, I'd do that. I'd have a cop car for a certain area, say, like, simply altering them where I'm from, and they'd go and visit all these spots all through the night, from, you know, from when the scoops finish up until whatever. Because they're not doing anything else, hardly, are they? The police. I don't know. No, oh, I don't. Well, they're, they're, they're dealing with their squads. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, bet, I bet there's no shortage of coppers to monitor in Manchester when all, no. the, when all the football fans are here. I bet you won't but be able to move for coppers. That's it. That's all you see them at, football matches, mm. and pulling people up for, uh, you know, motor offences. Just one other quick one as well, Alan. Go on. While, you're, while I'm on. Last night, I li like I say, living simply, there was a strong smell about between 9 and 10 o'clock. Mm. I'm not sure how long it went on for, but it was like... I don't know if you've ever smelled a rotting animal when you're out in the country and you can smell something <laughs> that's dead. I have. It smelled like that. And I was just wondering whether any listeners know where that smell was coming from. Oh, it right. wasn't coming from my house. You know, <laughs> I've told you to clean your teeth more often. <laughs> <I'll>, I'll, <yeah. laughs> All right, Ian wants to know, All where right, was the big stink Alan. from in Timperley? Cheers, mate. There was a big smell, apparently, late evening yesterday in Timperley. What was it? Did anyone else smell it, first of all? There's a great story tomorrow in the papers. It's embargoed, and I, don't, I, I often break embargoes because I think they're silly, but I won't break this one because it's a defence one and I might go to jail. But there's a great story tomorrow in your papers. No more than that. Suffice to say, it possibly involves little green men. That's it. I'm saying no more. I'm probably in trouble already. Brian says, Alan, you mentioned the possibility of taser guns being issued to all police officers in some police forces. You predicted that as a consequence of that, when a hand is raised against an officer, the likelihood was that he or she would have a taser gun fired at them. I'm sure there will be an increase in the use of the gun if its issue is extended to all officers, but nothing like the scale you inferred. Since their formation... Police officers have carried truncheons and or batons. Except in riot situations, how many times have you witnessed a truncheon being used on a member of the public? Even in public order situations where the police have to deal with drunken yobs fighting and struggling when arrested, you will have rarely seen that the person, that person being struck with a baton. I think that will be the case with the taser. I hope you're right, Brian. I really do hope you're right. But... 
unfortunately, the... And I, I, I take the point that the kind of policing is differently, but the opposite of the case, uh, of that, has been the case where they've been issued to all police officers elsewhere, predominantly in the United States. Predominantly, but not exclusively. So the opposite has been the case, but you may be right, and we do have a different police force, a police force which, despite the things I say on here, I, I rather like. I like our police force. I think we have a better police force than in many other nations. There are many nations that would swap theirs for ours like a shot. But nonetheless... We're still entitled to sit on the sidelines and gripe. We're talking about SATs, and Chris, an ex-teacher, said the problem is that, the his words, devious and crooked head teachers have taken over the, the, the idiot farm and they're now just teaching pupils to pass the tests. And an email from a person who wishes to remain anonymous. The ex-teacher is absolutely right. The schools not only choose to teach to the SATs, in other words, teach people, pupils through the SATs, teach to the SATs, they also choose which exam board to run, to run with, as some have easier pass rates than others. Yes, it's true, some boards are easier to get through than others. So even there, you have a problem of measurement. There's an obsession by politicians to try and measure success which can't be measured in this manner, as in real terms with the GCSE exams and above. Uh, there is, there is a, a several-part area of hands-on and written verbal examination types that show very different attributes and gives a much better measured balance to one's skills. Teaching towards an exam is one thing, but not to get to a standard that someone wants to measure. That's very different. Measuring stick, perhaps. Any use to anyone? Not really. I wish more teachers would put their heads over the parapet, but sadly, they are only looking to gold-plated pensions nowadays. And there you are. Two damning views of the education system. One from an anonymous individual who, ha who says, effectively, teachers have let it happen. They've stood by and let it happen. And another one that says that uh, a former teacher who says that head teachers are only interested now in the scorecard. Well, that's what we're on about, isn't it? A scorecard. How many, how many did you pass? How many passes? How many fails? That's all they care about. They don't care about whether every child got the best education that the child could have got. Quite extraordinary. 0161 228 2255. John in Chester. Hiya, John. Hiya. How are you doing, Alan? I'm very well. What can we do for you? Um, many years, well, for a number of years, I would I'd been a um, a special constable, which uh, I enjoyed very much when I first started because um, when I started off, you were a, you were a police officer. But sadly, as the time went on, and uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to slate. I'll slate the police, but also say that they have got a difficult job to do because they're being pulled apart. <laughs> they've got, so a, bl they've got a bloody night impossible job to do, haven't they? There's the truth of it, but go on. Yeah, and they're being, they're being pulled in so many different directions, that's why they have to have all these specialist teams. So, in the end, it it become really like America, really. That's all to say how it's become, because it's like you have the state police and you have your local sheriffs. And anything serious, the, the state police say handle it, and anything not so serious... Your, your local sheriffs deal with it. Well, okay, that's that's a similar, that's an example. But what what's it like within the police force in in this area? In your view, uh, I well, I mean they, they work very hard, mm. but I, I never agreed with it, and I didn't like it, and that's why I left. Mm. What didn't but, you agree with? I mean, there they are. I working. didn't. I didn't agree with not being able to go out and be. Uh, a proactive police officer. Mm. You have to um, deal with jobs that come in on the computer, and anything that jobs that come in over the air were, if they were serious, was not your, not your, <laughs> not your. Um, uh, what's name? What? What can I say? Not your forte. Mm. You didn't go to it. You let somebody else deal with that, and it could be just round the corner. So you you would be sitting there waiting for... Well, I, we had a, a serving police officer on the other week who said, just from an officer's point of view, you arrive at work and there is a list of jobs for you to... Already a list of jobs for you to do. You've, you're given your job tickets for that 
shift. You go off and do them. You never complete them because they, obviously they, they give you more than you need to do. And when you return, you add them back to the list. Yes. And a new list, of correct. course, has been made whilst you're away. That is, that is totally correct, yes. That's how it operates. And the, and the list keeps getting longer and longer and longer and longer. <laughs> uh, until it becomes... I mean, be, I, I recited my own rather superficial contact with crime yesterday where I had some... I had credit cards stolen out of a locker, that was it, but the copper never came for weeks on end. No. Uh, and uh, to this day, I have no idea what the outcome was other than I've got my money back off the bank, which is not really satisfactory, is it? Yeah. Uh, it well, they're be... getting more better over here at telling you if you ring the police, they, they tend to ring you back literally within an hour and tell you how things are going. Mm. Um, thanks for the call. Or, you know, So they're very good now over here at getting back to you for things. I will how, say that. How has it got to this, in your view? You you sounded as if you were a special for quite a while. Yes, I was, yes. So you you obviously will have observed the change. Yes. Uh, um, what was the driving force? What caused that change, in your view? I, I really have no idea where it come from. It's, mm. it's suddenly just come, literally, overnight once. It was just like they were building up to it slowly and said, right, we're going to change over to this system, and it did. And it was just like, there was no real place, to be honest, for, for the likes of me, because we were the last ones to move up with, with the flow, really, um, of, of this way of working. So it was very difficult to, for, for the likes of me, who was a bit special, to, to move along with that system at first for a long time. We were sort of left behind a little bit for a while. Yeah, because you're you're not going to be a specialist as a as a special copper. Your your specialism yeah. is is being out there on the street. Yes, and um, the whole idea of being a special constable was bridging the gap from the local community to the police, and especially people you know. But um, it was getting more increasingly hard to try and do that. What, what do your fellow police officers say about that? Because, of course, you I, d I don't want this to diminish your community contribution, but for you it was a, a hobby, if you like. For you it was something you yeah, did. I, I, can't say, I can't call it a hobby. I, I know, I, I knew you'd bulk at that. I was trying, <laughs> yeah. whilst, whilst I was apologising for that word, yeah. I was trying to think of its replacement, <laughs> but I couldn't come up with one. But, it, but it, it, was a, it was community work, for want of a better term. It was your, your contribution to our society, and we are, of course, universally grateful for that. But you couldn't get involved in specialist work because of the nature of your contribution, as it were. But what do those guys who join the police force for the same reasons that you did, but join it as a job, what do they think about the fact that they don't have to patrol the streets anymore? What they actually do is respond to the, the, to the tug on their wire, as it were. Uh, well, you, you'll always get um, some police officers that like that because you, you get two lots. You get some that are proactive and some that are reactive. So you'll get some that just react to what comes in on the radio, and you'll get others that are, are proactive who like to go and nosy and look for things. So you'll always get um, some that like it and some that dislike it. Fair enough. But they don't get a choice anymore. That's how it is. That, that's how it is, yes. That's and is that, is that universal? Is that... By universal, I don't mean every force. You can only speak for your, the, the one you served. But, but is it that it's like that every day for them or is it that well okay that's what it's like on two days a week but the other three they're back to to being a bobby no it's like that every day <laughs> that's it it's what what position you're in and what you do that's it <laughs> that's so it. effectively there are, we talk about having more bobbies on the beat but you seem to be saying that frankly there virtually aren't any bobbies on the beat no there's, I'd, I'd, say, I'd say there's more pushing paper mm than um, actually out there, definitely. Extraordinary. Particularly, you, we can link it in with education, particularly when an awful lot of the paper they're pushing is about providing statistics so that politicians can say, look what has been achieved. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Rather than, like with kids, that we can say, well, look, a lot more kids passed the SATs this year than they did last year, therefore it's got better. But the essence you feel, the sensation you feel when you come in contact with those kids is that they're not cleverer. They may well be better able to pass tests and deliver statistics, but they're not, they're not getting a rounded education. The police officers are not doing a, a rounded policing job. They're just filling in forms to make sure the politicians have got something to quote. Oh, yes, definitely so. It's, it, it probably obviously comes from the government, doesn't it? And, and comes down all the way down, doesn't it? Well, perhaps the answer then is in our own hands. There will be another election soon. Maybe so. <laughs> Good Thanks on you, John. Much. Cheers, mate. John well, Inchester, a former special cop. That's the part-time voluntary cops. We used to call them noddy bobbies until we got real noddy bobbies in the, com in the form of full-time specials. Well, that's what they are, aren't they? They're just full-time specials. 0161 228 2255. I tell you what, Alan says, Gordon, that's exactly what the coppers used to do to us kids. Harass us and pop out of bloody nowhere to catch you at it. That's it. That's what it was like, wasn't it? I remember those days. And I even remember them with a, a sort of fondness. I do. It felt all right. You you didn't want to get caught, but you felt reassured that there was a copper just around the corner. I mean, <laughs> ideally catching somebody else up to mischief. But they don't do mischief anymore, do they? They don't. Oi, come down at that tree. There's no way a copper would say that now unless the bloke up the tree had just murdered three people. They don't say come down at that tree. Get off there. Get off that bike on the footpath. That just doesn't happen. BBC Radio Manchester. Headline News. A court's heard a bus driver who hit and killed a lollipop lady in Salford may have lost control of his bus after suffering a coughing fit. Stephanie Davis was killed as she stood on the pavement. Official figures show there's been a significant rise in the rate of inflation. Analysts say rising utility bills and food prices are behind the increase. And fire crews are at the scene of a large blaze on the Bolton Berry border. They're tackling a large amount of plastic that's caught fire at the Bradley Fold industrial estate. People who live nearby have been advised to keep their doors and windows closed. Manchester's weather dry this afternoon with sunny spells and staying warm highs of 20 Celsius. I'm Anna Dawson. BBC Radio Manchester. 2020 traffic. If you're heading around the Berry area at the moment, do be aware that Radcliffe Moor Road is still closed off both ways because of a serious building fire around Berry New Road on the A58. Now, police are in attendance at the scene. They are redirecting traffic at the moment. So as you can imagine, traffic is starting to build up fairly quickly. Something to watch out for. If that's the way that you're heading this afternoon, you will get caught in some delays, I'm afraid. Thanks to Chris and Anne, who called in earlier to report the initial incident. Now to the motorways. Generally, everything fairly quiet for the moment. M6 traffic. Traffic not doing too badly, I notice. Between Junction 18 all the way up towards Junction 22, Newton to Willows, north and southbound. M60 traffic between Junction 12 at Eccles all the way through towards Junction 15 at the uh, Swinton Interchange again, moving at a nice steady pace on the clockwise and anti clockwise carriageway. So, all in all, fairly quiet for the minutes. Don't forget, of course, if you can update us, do get in touch hands free. The number to dial 0161 244 I'm Cara Banks. BBC. Radio Manchester Sports with Mark Elliott. Cristiano Ronaldo has reiterated his desire to stay at Manchester United. Despite interest from Real Madrid, who've gone public with their wish to sign the Portuguese winger, Ronaldo says he's right at the Old Trafford club. Didier Drogba's adamant that he and Chelsea teammate John Terry will be fit for next week's Champions League final against Manchester United in Moscow. Both players sustained injuries in Sunday's draw against Bolton. Drogba hurt his knee. Terry dislocated his elbow. Manchester City fly out for their end-of-season trip to Thailand and Hong Kong this evening. The city owner, Taksin Shinawatra, has promised that his review of the season during the tour will finally resolve the future of Sven Joran Eriksson. Eriksson says decisions need to be made quickly. Some of the players finish contract and they, they haven't been clearly said if they can have a new contract or leave. Uh, someone wants to have a new contract and nego all negotiations blocked since five, six weeks ago. So of course it's uncertainty uh, around all the place. 
Meanwhile, City will find out later today if they're to get England's final UEFA Cup spot through the Fair Play League. It's between the Blues and Fulham. The Fulham manager, Roy Hodgson, isn't so sure he'd welcome playing in Europe next year. It concerns me a bit. I mean, UEFA is wonderful to play UEFA football, but these fair play games, you have to come in very, very early in the competition. And I did it with uh, Viking in Stavanger. We got a similar ticket to UEFA. And it, you know, it took us about 12, 14 games by the time we got out of the group stages. And uh, so it, it might be, that might be a poison chalice they're offering me there. The Birmingham City co-owner David Sullivan has apologised for yesterday's astonishing attack on his players after they were relegated from the Premier League. Sullivan singled out defender Frank Cadru, claiming the previous manager, Steve Bruce, bought a pile of rubbish last summer. The Frenchman says O'Sullivan was frustrated, got a bit carried away, but now regrets the comments. Stockport County are advising fans that they won't be able to buy tickets for Saturday's crucial playoff semi-final second leg against Wickham on the day of the game. Although the match isn't yet a sellout, the club's urging fans to buy tickets well in advance. Berry Football Club will play Sheffield United in a pre-season friendly at Gig Lane. The former Shakers boss Kevin Blackwell will lead the Blades to Berry on the 29th of July. On to Rugby Union now, and the sale trio of Charlie Hodgson, Andrew Sheridan and Richard Wigglesworth have been named in the England squad to tour New Zealand this summer. Ben Foden misses out on selection, but has been called up to the England Saxons squad, along with Chris Jones, for next month's trip to the USA and Canada. Head coach Martin Johnson has appointed Steve Borthwick as captain in the 32-man squad for the Kiwi trip, which includes six uncapped players. Steve was a, an obvious choice. I think he's very well respected amongst the squad. He's, a, he's a, an established international player. He's a very good leader. He's a, a model player in the way he approaches the game. So, you know, he was a, he was a natural choice to, to lead the squad. Hull could be kicked out of the Rugby League Challenge Cup after the RFL revealed they're investigating a claim that the Super League club fielded an ineligible player in their fifth round win over Widnes. Prop forward Jamie Thackeray rejoined Hull from Leeds on March the 27th, more than three weeks after the initial cup deadline, but he still played in their 32-18 victory over the Vikings on Sunday. In cricket, the West Indies batsman Marlon Samuels is facing two years out of the game after being found guilty of corruption. The West Indies cricket board has concluded that Samuels illegally passed match-related information to a bookmaker during a series in India last year. And finally for now, after taking 53 wickets in 12 test matches, pace bowler Ryan Sidebottom has been named England Player of the Year. Morning sound better with Eamon O'Neill and Diane Oxford. Eamon and Diane. The sun is out, people are eating salad, so we're deciding to eat well. The only salad thing that was left when I went into a supermarket was rocket, and I thought people are just concerned about the carbon footprint that much that they won't eat anything that sounds good, <laughs> like anything that burns fuel. Eamon and Diane, and you. There's no weather in this country, so I want to go where it's nice. And what I would say to um, the people who are saying don't go on holidays, I would stay, stick your ideas about not travelling where the sun doesn't shine, because I'm, I'm going where the sun does shine like it all, it? <laughs> The Station with Eamon and Diane for breakfast. Never knowingly underdressed. Back tomorrow morning from 6 at BBC Radio Manchester. A very good day to you. Keith in Blackpool says, Hi Alan. Taking a deranged person out without first using other than the final option is an execution. If you can use a high-velocity sniper rifle, you can also use a lower-velocity alternative. If you can bring an elephant down with an anaesthetic for treatment, then revive it, why not a man? There are projectiles that stun with incredible pain. Yes, they do kill sometimes. However, a 7.62 millimeter is going to kill every time, nearly every time, when fired by a sniper who's good at his job. Not all the police are good around weapons, though. Remember, and then he gives a list, and I might get to that list in a minute, but you're right in what you say, in that shooting a person has to be, has to be the final option. I am emphatically, unequivocally against capital punishment. I cannot accept one single argument that says it is a good thing. There are none. It is in every measure a bad thing, in my view. However, if somebody is discharging a weapon 
like the barrister the other day, but it's a shame just to pick on him, but like the barrister the other day, he's discharging a weapon. He has to be stopped, not because he's aiming it at somebody, but because we don't know how good his aim is when he's not aiming it at somebody. He fired in the direction of police officers. I'm going on newspaper stories. He fired through the bedroom window, a child's bedroom window of a house opposite. The options to deal with that are nil, other than shoot him. Shoot him. If he's prepared to talk, if he's prepared to stop discharging the weapon, then we wait and we talk, if he will. We just wait if he won't, but if he's discharging the weapon, then you shoot him. It's horrible, it's reality. You say, if you can bring an elephant down with an anaesthetic for treatment and then revive it, why not a man? Well, have you ever seen an elephant brought down with an anaesthetic? I have on telly. They don't drop like a stone. They take a few moments. During the course of those few moments, you can get a lot of rounds off. There are projectiles that stun with incredible pain. I don't know of any. I don't know of any. Yes, the taser, and if it were possible to use a taser, use it. But it's rarely possible in that situation. It's just a cruel reality that sometimes, sometimes, people have done something which is very, very wrong, but, and this is the crucial bit, they are likely within the next few moments to do it again and that will put somebody else's life at risk. And that is the time I say lethal force is acceptable. No other, no other time, and only then, if somebody's life is going to be put in danger by doing nothing. What do you think? Well, we've heard, we've heard, the, we've heard what he thinks. He thinks, you've heard what I think, but what do you think? Yes, it is an execution, if you want to use that term. But I don't think there is a real alternative. 0161 228 2255. Derek in Stretford, hiya. Hello, Alan. What can we do for you, mate? Uh, I was listening yesterday, you know, about the um, lack of response to people complaining about um, harassments. Yeah. And um, right out of the blue... An old fat army friend of mine, we were, we're in your old fellow's regiment. All oh, right, <laughs> and, you poor uh, things. <laughs> anyway, uh, he phoned me, uh, but we've been talking last weekend about, no, on the phone. Yeah. About stupid response that these have. And he told me, his, his daughter told him, that his grandson, who was at Manchester University, last Saturday, Apparently, some of them had got, got uh, the, the, uh, the blues or something, you know. Uh, you, you get a blue if you represent the university, don't you? Yeah, yeah, that's what it's called. I don't and, know why. And, yeah. of course, they were celebrating, and... Um, put, uh, no, do you know the name of the street? Because it's uh, where, where all the students uh, are lodging. No, don't, really don't, all don't worry, just, just give us the detail we were, yeah. of what happened, and we'll worry yeah. about where well, it well, is well, later. Well, well, this street in Fallowfield mm. are almost always at all let off to student accommodation. Yeah. And, of course, they, they were celebrating, and, and it was going on and on, and, and more of joining in and everything. And then, I don't know exactly what time it was. I tried to find out, but I uh, didn't find out. There was a police, TA, uh, tactical aid unit then. Mm. He didn't know how many police, but loads of them, and a helicopter. And... They, you know, they out the blue, and the police all carrying batons and everything. Anyway, um, he didn't say exactly what had happened there, but the following day, a policewoman came down, knocking all the doors, all the student doors, telling them that there was no further uh, action to be taken, but they had to respond to a complaint. No way they from there. <laughs> so someone had complained that these kids were, were all partying like hell. And they yeah. turn out with a, a lot more coppers, a helicopter, yeah. and they did a tactical aid unit. Yeah. Well, they're going to be busy tomorrow, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> when when well, Scotland moves down here, they're going well, to be well busy. 
But from what, what we heard yesterday, from all the complaints to you that phoned in to you, they'd been complaining for weeks on end. They got no response. And got no response, yeah. I... Now, now, this policewoman told them the next day that they had to respond because they got a complaint. They got a complaint, yeah. We we have to deal with the complaints. It, <laughs> it's, uh, well, yeah, 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 as a former soldier, you will know the... Uh, oh, you yeah. will know, it's all, what was the... Was it Section 29, was it? Where you got done for either dumb insolence or answering back. That's right, yeah, you can't you get know, away. <laughs> you can't get away with it. It's Queen's you Reds, King's Reds in your day. They've got you every which way. It's the same you with know the what cops. I got done for? What? Walking through the barracks in Aldershot. Yeah. And a car driving through. I couldn't see who was driving the car because the sun was on the windscreen. Yeah. And it was my platoon commander. Oh, dear. I, and he got out of the car and he was going to charge me. And I said, I said, I said, Fa- I fail to you. salute. I said, <laughs> he said, but you know my car. I said, Look, they don't know who's in the car. I'm not going to start saluting cars. And anyway, <laughs> he, he probably wasn't driving with his hat on. <laughs> no. And if he's not yeah, got his hat on, you don't have to yeah. salute him. I never thought about that one. Ah, you've got to think ahead, man. You've got to be ready. Because it drives me mad. I see it on the telly. I bet I know, you do yeah. as well. I you see it on the same. telly, yeah. and you see squaddies yeah. with no hat on saluting. Yeah. I'm saluting officers in a hat on, which you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to. Yeah, because right. if they haven't got an hat on, they're not doing it. They're not an officer at that, that second, as it were. Right. Yeah, yeah, you it's don't possible. salute them without an hat. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it drives me mad. They're all jumping up and saluting. Anyway, um, maybe the police will phone in and tell you what happened on Saturday. I think that's quite unlikely. <laughs> I think it's almost, almost well, definitely well, unlikely. Well, well, shall I make it a complaint and they'll have to respond to Yeah, they'll complaint. have to respond, yeah, but they'll come to you, not me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Dear God, thank you very much. All right, I'll I'm up. not the only one, thank you. I, I'm glad to hear it, because it does, it drives me mad. And I'm not alone. You see, I thought I was. I get told at home, oh, shut up, it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. They spend a fortune on trying to get it right. They, they, paint, out, they, they, paint, they paint out the double yellow lines and they, they, cover, they cover pillar boxes with all sorts of gubbins to make it all realistic so that it really, 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 really looks for, for all the world like you've gone back 50 years and all the rest of it. They spend a fortune on the proper cars and all of that. And then they make stupid errors like that. It drives me mad. I don't believe what I've just read. I don't. I don't. And, uh, fortunately, it wasn't in a newspaper or something. But um, <laughs> this can't be true. I, the, the vision in my mind, the, the picture created by this is somewhat scary. David said, in the US... Tupperware parties have been replaced by taser parties attended by packed houses of women and organisers are making a fortune. What do they do at taser parties? I mean, I'm hoping the, the phrase, the name Ann Summers flashes through my mind and scares me half to death. What do they do at taser parties? Do they stun one another? Or is it like you get your... You, you know, like you can get strippograms. Somebody comes along dressed as a scally, and somebody... I don't know how a scally dresses. Somebody else comes along dressed as a copper, and then he or she tasers to the... I'm absolutely... You're going to have to give me more detail of what happens. And I don't want any of your imaginations ringing in. I don't want any of that rubbish. What happens at a taser party? Absolutely stunned. Which is appropriate, I suppose. Um, Another David in Crumpsall. You know the definition of a specialist, don't you? Someone who knows more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. That is true. There's a wonderful line in an operetta, Christopher Columbus, which is based on Offenbach's work. A hungover Queen Isabella of Spain asks her chief of police, I pay you to keep the peace. Why aren't you keeping it? And that's a wonderful line, is it? OK, well, I, 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 shall avoid, I shall avoid Offenbach's work in future. Doesn't quite work out for me, that. <laughs> there you are. Um, that's, that's weird, in the, in the strongest sense. And then Kevin says, you don't have to worry too much about crime and the like, being middle-aged and white. 
Recent reports state that of the 64 murders of young people in London since January 2007, over 44... I don't know what that means, over 44. Does that mean 45? Not sure, but anyway. Over 44 were black or ethnic from deprived areas. Of the 13 killed this year, only three had names I would describe as easily pronounced. And they wonder why a greater percentage of black and ethnic people were targeted by stop and search. I suppose you would. If you were a copper and you were looking for someone who might be in the process of committing a crime, would you stop a bloke dressed in a nice suit, wandering along with a, I don't know, briefcase and a copy of the Telegraph? He probably is involved in a crime. He's probably stealing billions. He's not it anymore. Ta-da now. 100,000 Rangers fans are on their way. So we're celebrating all things Scottish in Manchester.